Hello, welcome back to the Sanders Review. My name is Caleb Sanders, and today we're going to be doing a spoiler free slash spoiler review of a book that has really been making the rounds around the fantasy booktube uh, channels called The Will of the Many. This book has a staggering 4.7 rating on Goodreads, along with really high ratings on many other book sites, and it really is deserving of this. The Will of the Many is the fourth book by Australian author James Eilington, his previous trilogy, the Lycanius trilogy. I've read the first book. It was really good for a debut novel. It had a few issues which were had some commonalities with The Will of the Many, but we'll get into that later when we talk about some of the spoilers uh, that I feel uh, should be discussed personally. The Will of the Many is really only available right now in hardback, and so I read it in ebook. I rented it from my local library, which I think is a great way to go. The book is not necessarily groundbreaking in a lot of ways, but James Eilington, his prose is something that is just so beautifully written that it engages you from the very first page all the way through. There's some areas that you could maybe think like it would be a slog, but the characters and the prose and the dialogue is so believable that you as a reader just get pulled in. So let's jump into our spoiler-free review section. The world of the will of the many is such that as much depth as it shows for the areas that you explore through this author's writing, you know that there is a lot of area to explore in future books, and that's something really exciting. This is a world that experienced a cataclysm 300 years previously, where only 1 in 20 people survived, and is a world that is still rebuilding using the technologies from the past, from the previous advanced civilizations. The world has been conquered by a kingdom that becomes known as the Hierarchy. It's known as like the Katakan, 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 something empire. But it's known as the Hierarchy because of the social structures that are in place that surround the magic system itself and how it functions. Power in this world is based on a pyramid scheme style system that you have these eight different levels of society where the lowest levels, they seed a good portion of their mental and physical will their essence, their spirit, up to the next higher level. And that just continues up. So the higher you go on the pyramid, the fewer and fewer people there are to the point where somebody at the top has enough will coursing through them from the people below them that they're able to do fantastical feats of almost like investiture where they're able to, uh, to bind things and perform feats of strength and of essence and of transportation, just all these amazing things, which you know there's going to be many more as we go along through this trilogy, I believe is what it's supposed to be. The plot of this book centers around a guy named Diago. He's a teenager who is soon set to be beyond his minority, becoming a, a full-blown adult man who at that point is expected to cede his will to a higher person, and he hasn't done that yet. We start off seeing Diago in a prison, and at nights he would go and fight in this arena to be able to try to make money, to be able to support himself and try to save money so you can try to escape from this hierarchy system in some way. He goes and uses the library as much as he can to try to keep himself sharp mentally. And that is where we see this man who we know as Diago, but you know from the very beginning, there's other things going on with this individual. Very quickly, Diago gets into a situation where he is given the opportunity to be able to go to a hierarchy school, the hierarchy school, that trains leaders for the future of the hierarchy system. And he is sent there uh, by his adoptive father, who he has a quest and goal that he is supposed to try to achieve. And that's something you find out as you go through. And that's a very believable point. Um, but as he gets into the school, obviously he gets sucked into the learning process and the environment and the culture within the school, which becomes a big core of the will of the many. This point of him having to hide his identity, assume a new identity, and infiltrate a school that is training leaders for the future is one of the points where a lot of people draw comparisons between The Will of the Many and Red Rising, which you can see that comparison, but it's also a common trope in books. So it's not really a blatant copying as much as it is just a successful trope being used. As time goes on, he has to advance and try to get higher and higher up in the society. That's something that his adopted father has told him he has to do. Otherwise, he could be thrown out and face severe consequences. And every friend that he makes along the way doesn't know his true identity. 
and every one of them is somebody who he may have to betray at some point in the future, which kind of causes him some mental anguish as he starts to really care for some of these people. The island that the school is located on uh, has these advanced ruins from the previous civilizations that he has to go explore. And as you explore them, you really get to see a glimpse into what this series can become. I can only imagine, based on what is shown with the advanced technologies and the, the plot devices that are coming to play in this book, that are looking ahead towards future trilogies. As amazing as this book's overall storyline is with the character development and the world building, it has one of the best backstory exploration trips that I think I have read in any sort of novel, be it sci-fi, fantasy, historical fiction, anything, uh, when you are able to go along with Iago and explore his backstory and where he came from. I feel it's one of the most perfect explorations of a character's past and its motivations for the present and the future. The conflicts that are in this book, there is a wide variety from the fighting that you see in the very beginning to some of the training that takes place as he prepares to go to this school. There's almost some Maze Runner-ish style of uh, devices that he has to navigate. There are some elements that slip in that are almost horror in nature. We saw this in the Lycanius trilogy, at least in the first book that there's a moment that happens in The Will of the Many where it, this, this scene that takes place, the description of what is happening is very visceral and almost gorge-worthy where you're reading this and if you put yourself in that place, you can smell the just destruction that is taking place. And that is believable, but also at some time it feels out of place almost. Like things, and all of a sudden it's just like, it almost is meant to be a, a gut punch for the reader, and it almost comes too far out of left field. There are some conflicts in the school itself as he has to advance because to advance to a higher level in the school, the school itself mirrors the pyramid structure of the hierarchy. And to advance, there are sometimes conflicts. You either have to prove your worth intellectually or you have to, through competition, advance to the next stage, which that is important for you in your future the stage that you end in the school. The Will of the Many is an amazing book overall with the pros and things. There are some negatives that I would highlight. Many elements of the book are very foreseeable and obvious, and there are some things that come up that are just very far-fetched in their nature that you're like, this most likely wouldn't have happened, uh, or it's just very convenient plot armor in a way uh, helping Diago at this point. If you don't know, a Mary Sue character is one who is very capable, overly so, who it seems like without a lot of effort or without a lot of development is able to just be amazing at a lot of things. And while Diago's backstory shows that he has training and he has these abilities, it just almost feels like he is too good at too many things at times, if you know what I mean. And it may not be a Mary Sue, but there's some elements that are just like a little too much of things coming too easily to him at times. That's not meaning that things are easy because he very much has very consequential things happen to him throughout the story. The book's about 600 something pages. Don't let any of these negatives throw you off from reading this book. This is a book that can take a while, a bit of an effort, but overall it is a must read if you are into any form of fantasy. I would give The Will of the Many a try. And now we're gonna go ahead and jump into the spoiler section of this book. Three, two, one. The opening of The Will of the Many is a absolutely perfect opening to grab a reader's attention. Jumping into Diago, who we later know his name is Viz Telinus, Viz Telinus, something like that, uh, his character working in this prison that holds these people who are being sapped of their will against their will. So in the world of the hierarchy, you either willingly cede half of your physical and mental will to the next level person who are you are under, or you will be in these prisons being sapped of your entire will. And you see that if this is only one of many prisons, that there are tens of thousands of people who are just, in a sense, being enslaved for their will in these sappers. The opening scenes are just very dark in essence, but they're an amazing window into this world. And Viz's uh, approach and how he has to try to maintain his facade and maintain his freedom from this system. Seeing Viz interact with the guy who's going to become his adoptive father uh, is interesting because Viz, you see some of his background, the fact that he knows a lot of these uh, these dead languages, which kind of, you know, uh, it kind of hinders him later on when he gets caught because of that. But 
uh, with that, you go into the, the fight and the training and what takes place, and you see his capability. Again, is he a bit of a Mary Sue? I mean, he's not seeding Will, so he has his full strength, but then he's able to take on these people who are multiple levels above him. Uh, it's setting the stage for who he is, but it also seems a little far-fetched at times. Suspension of disbelief, it's fine. As Viz goes and travels as he's on the, the different devices, seeing what the hierarchy is able to create, that's amazing. Going his training in the manor uh, is a very believable process. I mean, seeing him grow, it again calls back to kind of Red Rising, the preparation for going to the Institute, uh, but for Daryl going to the Institute. But it's a very believable process, uh, and we see his preparation, the building upon the foundation he already had from his childhood. Um, being the long-lost prince of the last kingdom to fight against the hierarchy. Um, that whole hidden prince trope, I don't mind it that much because it's not, oh, you're this farmhand who all of a sudden is the heir to the kingdom. Uh, it's not that, right? He knows he's the prince. He's just in hiding. So I think that's a, a good, believable plot point in this series. Can we get to the Colosseum scene? I mean, for crying out loud, the Colosseum scene just came out of left field. Like, it shows the power that is at play in this book. I That is not a question at all. But when the resistance comes in, when his uh, his father's advisor, uh, or guard, I can't remember off the top of my head, when he comes in and just through the energy blast lays waste, and tens of thousands of people are basically liquefied, and their organs and awful are just everywhere, that just is so out of left field, it's just borderline horror-esque. It reminds me a little bit in the Lycanius trilogy of the scene with the body swapping, how at some point there was even like uh, children's heads being put on adult bodies that are left to just be a shock factor for people going by. It just feels a little out of place and doesn't maybe deserve how horrifying. Now, this is to set the scene for how this series is going to progress and the the grit and darkness of the series, I understand it just felt a little out of left field to me. I feel like that should be something that grows into that level of gore. The description of the ancient structures with the bodies, with the dead eyes, with the obsidian, that is again a little kind of horror-esque, but it really does set the stage and you're very drawn in to think what the heck has been going on in these locations and what has Viz got himself into uh, at this academy. James Eilington does such an amazing job describing the scenes, the settings, the world, the prose. You get drawn into this book in such an amazing way. You can see why this is some people's favorite book that came out in 2023. Maybe I wouldn't put it as my favorite, but for crying out loud, it is pretty high up there. As I mentioned in the spoiler-free section, the trip to his home island how much better of a backstory exploration could you get the second you hear he's going to be going to this island you immediately know oh my gosh something ridiculous and crazy is going to happen and you explore and see the world that was lost in the changes that were taking place the way the hierarchy comes in and destroys cultures in the past to create new advances when you're like it probably was amazing to begin with now one thing about this exploration is you do see maybe how insignificant this island was although there are are clues dropped throughout the story to realize that his home island had some knowledge that is going to be vital in the upcoming season with the, I think it's called the synchronicity, uh, that is the fear of what's to come. And you kind of, you have those drops, which I think are really good, but is there enough there to show Viz being as capable as he is with the fighting, with the strategy, with his knowledge? Maybe it's a little much. That's where kind of he has those Mary Sue qualities. But overall, it just does an amazing job showing where he came from. And then also looking at his romance development uh, at that time period. It's just very believable. And you just get sucked into the microplots that are throughout this book. Mentioning some of the things that he's good at. Uh, the way in which Will was used to be able to have the fighting using the wooden dummies and stuff. I thought that was really amazing. Was he too good at it? Maybe. Eh. Uh, but you also seeing his training scenes with his friends I thought was really, really cool. Viz's relationships with Calidus, Calidus, and Aiden, his two, uh, his two friends that he develops, I think that is a very strong part of this book. You're able to see the way he is able to overcome the animosity and then separation between he and these, these friends, which Calidus, I mean, Calidus, Calidus, something like that, 
uh, is such a key part to his story. And at the end with Calidus dying, that is a something that you don't see coming. I thought that was a great part of the story. And it's just an example, I think, of James Islington really pulling the reader in and saying, you know what? There's nothing for certain in this book. Having Relucia, his adopted mother, actually being a leader of the resistance, I think that's an amazing thing because, you know, again, these layers within this society where his adoptive father doesn't even know what is happening. And so there's opportunities for plot building and world building in the future, which is absolutely amazing. Now, let's take a second and talk about the wolf. Um, Cool scene saving the wolf. The one wolf that you save coming back to be a figure which helps you survive in a very obvious negative situation later on as he explores the uh, the ancient structures and be able to go through the maze and the gauntlet with the, uh, with the shades and all that. Um, just a little too convenient for me. A little bit. Um, it's plot armor. Something like that, okay. It's advancing the story. It just felt a little too convenient for me. I don't know. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't. Let me know in the comments where you agree with me where you don't. That's what I love about reading. It is subjective. And we all are going to like or dislike or be critical of certain elements, which is why we have so many books in the first place. I thought the idea of him getting the message carved on his skin and later on finding out that it's his clone copy whatever in the alternate dimension universe world place. We'll find out more about that as the series progresses. And one of the final notes for me that was kind of obvious from the beginning with, uh, with his adoptive uh, uncle, that if you don't see the dead body, how do you know it's dead? That is just plot in any book 101. If you don't see the dead body, is it dead? And that's something that you kind of see. The way in which it's brought about, I think, is a very unique thing that James Eilington did. But from the beginning, I knew. I, I didn't know, but there was a good chance he was still around. Now, how would I rate the will of the many? There are some elements, obviously. Future Caleb here just saying that now that I have weighed through everything and edited this video, um, the will of the many, I am going to give it a 4.5 because I initially gave it a 5 after going through and just really thinking about all the elements that just really feel not like copies, but it seems like a there's a lot of things that are foreseeable and a lot of things that are copies. So I'm going to give this a 4.5. Disagree with me. Was it my favorite book from 2023? No. Was it one of my favorites? Yes. Will I be reading this trilogy as it comes out? You better believe it. That's it for me today. Please like, comment, subscribe. Let me know in the comments where you agree or disagree with me. I would love to hear from you, especially if you have any recommendations for other books that I can be reading and reviewing here on this channel. Please go ahead and click up here for my original video explaining who I am and just what I love about books, just my introduction to this channel. Go ahead and click up here for my last review of a very fun, easy read by John Grisham called Playing for Pizza. So that's it for me. Have a great day. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.